Well, another local authors series uh, today, Bases Loaded, a sequel, Inside Stories about Eli Crow, Psy, Terminator, and the Expos by Danny Gallagher. And joining Danny, uh, who is a, uh, you know was in Montreal for many years covering the Expos, Steve Neymark, a District 2 constituent of mine, a big Expos fan, former media person himself, who, who made a contribution to this book, in fact, and, and also uh, pursued me to make sure I did a, did a couple of stories on Danny's book. So, Danny, a terrific book. Uh, it's a labor of love for you, isn't it, to write these books? Oh, for sure. I've been writing books about the Expo since 1997, and I've kind of picked it up a notch, uh, getting pensioned off a few years ago and having a lot of time to spend on the, on the keyboard. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, I had Blue Monday in 2018, and then in 2020, I always remember then, uh, 2021 was never forgotten. And then this book basically loaded. So I'm just trying to keep the Expo's legacy alive. Yes, and you're doing a great job of that. Now, now uh, Steve, there was a, uh, uh, a section on you in the book. Uh, how did that come about? Uh, that came about through a mutual friend of Danny's, Eric Grabisky, who is uh, my son Barry's best friend. Uh, we got a hold of Danny and said, Stevie Bean, the sportscaster, that he was back in the uh, mid seventies at CBMT, CBC Montreal. I was fortunate and lucky enough to do a baseball show called Expos This Week uh, with the late and great Howie Reed as my uh, co-host during the show. What would, we would do is film the first 20 minutes at uh, City de Havre, uh, which is a, a basin uh, off of St. Helens Island where uh, that 20 minutes would come up first and then the last 10 minutes of the show uh, we would do the Expos uh, pregame broadcast. If it was an eight o'clock home game in Montreal, we were on for that final live 10 minutes after the pre-recorded 20 minutes with all the Expo players that I mentioned, some in the book, uh, Ron Hunt. Uh, there was also Rusty Staub, Ron Fairley. Uh, and, and, and the show itself came about when Jim Fanning, uh, the lady great, left us too early about seven years ago, uh, would bring all the players down with John McHale, the president of the Expos, and they would do the show with me. And that's where it all started. And then, of course, my sports cast, uh, six nights a week at CBMT, would be full of baseball, hockey, and football, uh, being the sportscaster assigned to that job at night. So great. And, and uh, Danny, uh, what I found fascinating about this book is, I, I haven't really read, it was just incredible that you actually did true interviews with people. You went to Jeff Reardon, Otis Nixon. How did you track all these people down and how many interviews did you actually do for this book? I did 65 interviews. Now, it's interesting. I would track players down from having, you know, the numbers of some of these players from bygone years. But then I would always have to, you know, contact other people to get uh, phone numbers. Or I may even go online and, and find people through Googling and, and find numbers where these people live. Or and in some cases, Mike, I even wrote postal letters asking them to see if they'd wow. be interested in uh, doing an interview. So that was the one way the postal letter that I got Ken Phelps to talk to me. He only played briefly in 1982, but as part of this book, there's a lot of part-time players I wanted to give recognition to. Somebody told me a long time ago, it's not just the star players that make up a team. There's the part-time players, the average players. And so I wanted to give credit to some of these people. I'm 59 years old. So my late my dad, my late dad, Larry, who covered the Expos, from a very, very young age, my brother Chuck and I went to a ton of Expos games. We used to keep a record, and it was a bad record because there was one or loss, and uh, we would go to Jerry Park. I think one year we saw 60 games at Jerry Park. So when you go back and talk about Larry Lintz and, and players that a lot of people may not remember, uh, believe me, we remember them very well. And it was so interesting to to see what they're up to. And I could sit here all day and talk to you about some of the uh, paragraph, some of the sections you did in your book. You mentioned Ken Phelps. Uh, I didn't know that Larry Parrish had a fear of flying. That's hard to believe for a major league <laughs> baseball player. Uh, uh, you talked about Doug Flynn, who was a great uh, fielder, um, you know, a great player, great second baseman. 
Uh, Mike Stenhouse, who is now a CEO of a public policy think tank. Um, I love the uh, the thing, Danny. You were not you were not at the uh, the Major League All Star Game personally, were you uh, for the Expos that year? Were you there? Uh, not not 1982. No, well, I was I heard there. Lots of good stories. I was there uh, covering it for the old Sunday Express newspaper. Steve, you remember the Sunday Express? And uh, and wow, uh, I'll never forget that experience with the Expos there. But you but you wrote it as if you were there, and it was just great memories. Something that we may never experience again. Uh, I found it interesting that most people watching this don't know who Rene Guimont was. I remember Rene Guimont very well when he was head of marketing uh, for the Expos. I can't believe that Rene Guimont would not return any of your phone calls to talk about marketing the Expos. I thought that he would have been gung-ho about you know, giving himself recognition for the great job in organizing the 82 All-Star Game. Yes. But uh, at least I gave him some credit in the book. I want to give Rene credit in the book because it took, what, three or four years to actually organize the game. It's yeah. not an easy... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Danny's audio is uh, tuning out. So I'll, while he tries to fix that, I'll switch to uh, to Steve. Steve, you're still wearing your Expos jacket, so you're still uh, a big fan, aren't you? Oh, very much so. Um, one thing I was not only a broadcaster, proud to be and fortunate to be, I was also a fan. And I think that helped. I, I grew up with the Expos. Used to meet my, my late father, Jerry Park, I uh, would do my, my disc jockey show in Cornwall an hour away and drive in almost every night the Expos were at home and meet him at the ballpark and then drive back the next morning to do my radio show in Cornwall. Uh, that was the start of it. Uh, moved up to Smith Falls to do play-by-play -play hockey for the hockey team there and was sports director. And, and then was lucky enough to do a, a, a test uh, at, uh, in Montreal to get my job with the Expos. Uh, I was, I think, one of 12 didn't no one else had the tv experience uh, i was just a radio guy and i was lucky enough to get that job and then was hired by the cbmt cbc crew and then up came the expos uh, to do their broadcast i was asked to do that but being a fan was part of it uh, you grew up in montreal loving baseball we all had our teams i was a big cincinnati reds fan and others were other teams but when the expos came along it was your allegiance to the expo that followed suit. So walking in that dressing room, meeting the likes of Roger Brulat and Denny Casavan later, uh, all those pay players uh, or broadcasters rather that did the games, th that was phenomenal for me. And being a fan was a big part of it, yes. So Danny, I hope your audio is back. Uh, you're, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask you, Bert Roberge, I didn't know that he spoke French. Yeah, he spoke a little bit of French, it wasn't fluent. But uh, somebody had advised me to do a story on him. One of his neighbors in Maine uh, Facebooked me and said, look at Danny, would you be interested in doing a story on my neighbor, Bert Roberge? So I knew that he, Bert Roberge had played for the Expo, but I would kind of lost memory that he'd actually spoke a little bit of French. So there, there was obviously a great connection there because Montreal, a great French city and uh, so on. So I got a hold of him and he was thankful that I uh, tracked him down. Uh, Danny, uh, the the uh, most fascinating chapter of the book, I read it twice, it was so fascinating, was your interview with Jeff Reardon, who, uh, who you know, I, I remember the story, but I didn't remember all the details that he actually, you know, he lost a child um, in very sad circumstances, and uh, he was on medication and he robbed a jewelry store in West Palm Beach. And it looked like that could have been the end of his career. Somehow he's come back. Expos Best has brought him back to uh, uh, to speak at, at events and so on and so forth. But he was pretty uh, forthcoming with you. Yeah, for sure. Him and his wife and some of the people in the police department. Uh, there was a bad moment in time for Jeff and his family losing his son. And then he was on drugs, I guess, uh, because of the situation with his last son and he for some reason, he decided he's going to go and rob the, the jewelry store. So he was kind of forthcoming about that and spending time in in prison and where he was, uh, you know, given some drugs to kind of calm him down. And now, you know, Mike, I hope that the 
one of the Hall of Fame's veterans committees will consider him for induction into the Hall of Fame in the next few years. There are different uh, veterans committees uh, involved and hopefully somebody will put him on that committee and get the voters to vote him in. One, one player you didn't interview, and I don't know if you'll ever get to interview him because I think a lot of people would like to know the true story and that's John Wetland. Uh, have you done any uh, research on what happened to him? Because he was here a few years ago in Montreal uh, for the uh, sports breakfast we had at the Cummings Centre, and then he got arrested for uh, uh, sexual assault. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, have you followed that that story at all? We're talking about another reliever I, here. I, I must admit I have not. He was always a favorite uh, player of mine. Him and I got along really good. Uh, I remember one time, this was like, oh, 1992, in spring training, he kicked his foot in disgust and he broke his foot. And so they, the Expo sent him back to hospital in Montreal to recover. And I called him up. I got a hold of him in the hospital and expressed my condolences and you know did a story. And after that, he was always grateful to me for uh, showing interest in him, not just as a person, but as a, a pitcher. And, uh, you know, at a frequent Expos Fest uh, a few years ago, he came up to me and he, and he hugged me. So I've always been fond of John Wetland. But to be very honest, the recent situation with uh, the sexual assault, I have not been any. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just find it fascinating. But Steve, if we go back to the Steve Neymar days, uh, we talked about the Terminator, Jeff Reardon. Uh, we talked about uh, John Wetland, great stopper. But the big stopper in your day was Mike Marshall. Remember Mike Marshall, Steve? Did you ever meet him? Yeah, I, I met him very much so. Uh, a little withdrawn, difficult to talk to. Uh, some of them were like that. It was even difficult to talk to Gene Mock. He'd be in the dugout before the game. And he was only concentrating on the baseball game itself. So some players you sort of stayed away from. Uh, and, and you knew your, your space. Uh, a lot of others were just so phenomenal to speak to. Uh, the Ron Fairleys of the world uh, got to know. Uh, superhuman beings. And, and of course, the baseball show that we did brought in all those players. Um, but yet, getting back to the Expos played at the start of the 68 season, I think a lot of people don't remember how the Expos were allowed to come to Montreal uh, when Mayor Jean de la Po with Jerry Snyder, his counselor, brought the Expos in on the basis that they would have to play at the Olympic Stadium. That was the guarantee to get the franchise. Okay. And Warren Giles, the National League president at the time, said, fine, once 76 comes, you got to move into the Olympic Stadium, guys, out of that, they called it the bandbox at Jerry Park. I, for one, felt they could have refurbished Jerry Park and stayed here. I don't think the National League people would have pulled the plug on us. And who knows, maybe we'd still be playing at Jerry Park to this day. Anyway, that's, that's one thing I, I, I'd like to throw out there to the people watching that, the, if they remember those days. Danny, I, I, the more I talk to Steve, the more I say is uh, I think we got some great material for the next book. It might be a co-authored book between Danny and Steve. He's got such stories, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, Steve has got some great memories. He's a good talker. He's been talked to those former players many years ago. He's got a great encyclopedia knowledge of the Expos for sure. Now, a few more notes I'll share with readers and, and I'll ask you to comment on a few before we wrap up. Uh, Otis Nixon was arrested uh, for drugs in uh, Georgia. Uh, he spent two and a half years with the Expos, became a big star with the Braves. And once again, Danny, you reached him and you got him to talk to you. Yeah, Otis, it's always been uh, cooperative over the years to talk. Sometimes he's hard to track down, but uh, he talked about his time with Whitney Houston and then the friendship he had with Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown and, uh, he made a good, solid career uh, out of baseball, made a lot of money, and, and still a, a real down-to-earth gentleman. Another anecdote, uh, uh, Jake Allen, goalie for the Montreal Canadiens, didn't know until I read your book that Kurt Allen, uh, his dad, was the catcher for the late Rail Cormier, who, of course, was a big star in the major leagues from New Brunswick, played for the Expos, passed away sadly. So you uncovered a nice little gem there. Did you actually talk to Kurt Allen, uh, Danny? Yeah, yes, I did. I talked to Kurt and a few other uh, folks down in, in New Brunswick. Uh, 
who also played not only with Ray L. Cormier, but Bill Lee. See, Bill Lee played for the Moncton Mets from 84 to 88. So there's a great uh, admiration for Bill Lee in the Maritimes. Yeah, and you did another great uh, section uh, on Aislinn, Larry Walker, of course, Bill Lee, the late Gary Hughes, a uh, uh, great scout who I had interviewed many times, didn't know until I read your book that he passed away in, in 2020. Ron Darling, who was an expo for two weeks. Uh, you talk about players like Maury Wills, Greg Nettles, Nate Colbert. I still remember Nate Colbert's batting stance and how he would hit the ball out of the park. Jose Canseco had a cup of tea with the Expos. Mel Hall, I always wondered what happened to Mel Hall. Mel Hall got into a lot of trouble as well, it seems. He married a Montrealer at one point. So, uh, And finally, also a, a great, uh, a great uh, section on Mike Jorgensen, number 16, who came in the big rusty stop trade. So it's a fantastic book. Danny, how can people get copies? Yeah, they can go to Indigo or Amazon and even get it at, at certain Indigo stores. And they, they can also get a, a mail copy, a, a personalized copy from me by calling this number uh, 365-881-2389. 365-881-2389. But the, the main places where people get it is is uh, Indigo and Amazon. Perfect. Well, we'll do our best to promote it. Danny, good luck. Thank you very much. And Steve, thanks for joining us as well. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Great having Thank you, gentlemen. You lot, with uh, us. Mike. Great talking to you.